Well, this is part two of the series we're going through, a three-part series called Ecclesia, the Ecclesia. And I know this sounds like a really weird word. Uh, none of, most of y'all probably didn't go to Greek's uh, class or learn Greek. And so we've been unpacking what this word means and why is it significant. And Ecclesia was the word that the early church, the first century church, chose to describe themselves. In fact, Jesus chose this term when he told Peter that on this rock he was going to build his church. He uses the word Ecclesia in Greek. This is the Greek word that was chosen, ek, meaning to call and and klesia meaning to call out. And so last week we kind of set that up. Today I want to unpack a little bit more what that looks like. And here's the point, right? Why do this? Does it make me sound cool that I know Greek? No, okay? I, that's not what the point of this is. The point of it, what we're trying to get out of it is, okay, this is, the, this is what the first century church decided they wanted to look like. But we're the 21st century church. Does it mean that we're immune? <laughs> Probably not. And so what we've been doing with this series is really just comparing what, what did the first century followers think they were supposed to be up to with what maybe we as individuals and then maybe even we corporately are up to today? And where are the misalignments that we might be able to bring into alignment? Because I, I feel like, I, I'm not, I don't call myself a reformer, but I felt like throughout my ministry, I've just been called to this place where I've looked at the church, a church I'm serving or the church global and gone, I don't think that's what Jesus would have us do. And so some of that's been challenging, right? Because we get comfortable and we get, you know, we get complacent with how we do things or why we do things. Um, but as I said last week, when our preferences get in the way, right, we, we, the church loses influence. And, and when our preferences get in the way, people get hurt, right? Uh, when, when our style of worship is the best style or when our, we sit in chairs, not pews, well, we sit in pews, not chairs. We like air conditioning. We like music. We don't like either of those things. Though, though in Alabama, I don't think you could get away with not having air conditioning. I'm sorry. Um, we're not necessarily like one of those attractional churches, but like y'all not even show up if we didn't have air conditioning, right? Um, so, so like well, how do our preferences get in the way? How do our preferences get in the way what God might be up to? So we started with this verse last week, um, and it, this is from uh, Acts chapter 2, right after Pentecost. If you're not familiar with that story, uh, Pentecost was the moment where Jesus has gone back to heaven, and now for the very first time, the apostles are in charge, and they're given the gift of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus promised would happen. They're, they're, they're set free to be able to kind of share the gospel in lots of different languages, and really great, awesome, miraculous things happen. Uh, and then Peter gives this awesome sermon uh, to the people who are like, what is going on? How, why are you all the way that you are? Like, how cool was it that their faith and their, their walk with Jesus was so apparent that someone looked at them and went, wow, why are you this way? What is going on? I, I, I wish that for all of us, right? Um, but anyway, that happens. Peter gives this awesome sermon, and then they say, what should we do, right? And he goes, repent and believe the gospel. And like 4,000 of them were baptized, and awesome, stool, cool stuff happens. And this, this is their continuation. So after all of that, and that cool public moment, Here's how they went back to day-to-day -day life. It goes like this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. In other words, like this wasn't just a flash in a pan thing to them, right? The world was different. <laughs> Jesus was alive. When anybody walks out of the grave, it's kind of a reset button, right? Like, I don't know if you've seen that happen. I personally have not, but I think if it happened right in front of me, I like, you know, again, I, I say this all the time. If somebody can predict their own death and resurrection and pull it off, I'm with them, right? <laughs> like, that's it. And Jesus did that. And so they're like, my whole life is different. The way I look at the world is different. And, and my passions are different and my priorities are different. And so they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to what Peter was saying, to what the groups of the, the, the early the, the disciples were saying, like, this is what Jesus taught. And here were his parables. And he gave this thing called the Sermon on the Mount. And they listened. Tell us more. Tell us more. And then it says this, every day, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And what we said last week is that kind of our, our manifestation of that in the, in the 21st century is, you know, they, they gathered to hear the apostles' teaching, right, which is Sunday morning, and then they gathered in each other's homes and, and, and broke bread and shared with glad and sincere hearts. Hey, that's what we call small group. That's a circle, right? So rows and circles. And that's how we as a church have kind of organized ourselves. Now, there's one ingredient to what they were able to do in the first century that if I, people ask me this all the time, if there's one thing that I could make everybody who calls themselves a Jesus follower do, um, that would be a scary thing, right? But if there's one button that I could push, all right, if there's one button I could push and all of us would end up with this, it's actually something that the first century church already had, but I would want it for you too. It's big, active faith. All right, now, big faith and active faith, I think of the same thing, but in our day and age, like, I feel like it's really important to separate these two words because big faith is faith that does something, right? 
Peter didn't just come and experience Pentecost and go, wow, that's really cool, and then go home, right? He didn't go, oh, I've had such a religious experience, and then not do anything about it. No, he, he, he shared his faith. He gave his four-point sermon, right? The, uh, you know, God, God, you killed him, God raised him, we've seen him, say you're sorry, right? That was what he did over and over again through the book of Acts. And he didn't quit until everybody had heard this story. It was big, active faith. He believed deeply because of what he'd seen and what he experienced, and then it made him do something, right? And if I could push a button and make everybody have this, this is what I would give you. And, and spoiler alert, if you're new to our church, at the end of the day, with all the fancy words and all the great music and all the cool small groups and all the great stuff we do with kids and the next generation and all that, we're just trying to give you this, Okay, so you can fast forward the process and jump in right now if you really want to. Um, but faith that changes, faith that grows, faith that makes different decisions and sets different priorities and moves in a different direction because of what you've experienced. That's what we want for everybody. And listen, this is me, okay? I'm making an I statement on this one, all right? I have personally experienced faith and life without Jesus and then turned around and experienced things with God that made me look at the world differently in a way that I may never look at it. You know, I may be able to never be the same again. And I'll take this any day of the week. Now, I've said this before. This is not a new thing. In fact, I think I said it a year and a half ago when I was looking back through my sermon notes. So if you've been around a long time, you've heard what I'm about to say before. But if you're new, this is brand new. It's just for you, right? Um, did you know that in the New Testament, there are only two times in the entire New Testament that Jesus was amazed? Did you know this? There's only two times that something happened and it completely amazed and impressed and left Jesus in awe. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd love to be one of those people that made, like impressed Jesus because I think, you know, this is the son of God. He's seen it all. He was there at creation. And so he's seen everything, and, and he knows everything. He has all knowledge and all power and all the things, and he's impressed and amazed at something, right? Uh, now, the first instance of this is a story that if you grew up in church, you've heard before. Um, it, it's found in uh, a couple of the Gospels. These are um, it's a story that, that's fairly familiar to people. I'm going to give you the cliff notes, and I'm going to tell you what happened. Okay, so essentially Jesus is in town one day. Uh, he's teaching. There's a crowd that's following around him, and a centurion uh, is a leader of the Roman kind of army, a militia leader, comes up to, to Jesus and says, hey, I've got a, ser a servant that's sick, and I've been watching you, and I know kind of what you can do, and I would like you to heal my servant. Now, Jesus kind of stands and, and looks him up and down for a minute, and the crowd, golly, they're in Galilee right now, so the crowd is like, this is a Roman, this is our enemy, right? So they're watching to see if Jesus is going to heal this person or not, right? Is Jesus going to cross over enemy lines and help somebody who we would consider to be, like, against us? And so there's, like, everybody kind of steps back, and Jesus is looking this guy up and down. And he goes, you know what, yeah, I'll come with you. Take me to your house, and I will heal your servant. And the, the centurion goes, hold on, no, 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 stop. Yeah, actually, <laughs> I've been watching you and, and and I know something about you that you and I are kind of the same in fact these are the words that he says he goes um, I've been watching you and, and you seem to have power that is given to you and you're, you're you're relating to somebody that's above you and he goes this for I I myself and, and maybe a better translation is I too like you which is what it actually says I too like you I'm a man under authority with soldiers under me. In other words, Jesus, I've been watching you, and, and what you're doing is not just of you. There is something bigger and grander going on that you're a part of. And like you, when I, you know, my soldiers only do what I tell them to do because I represent the Roman Empire, right? And so when I say, hey, go into battle, they go into battle. When I say, hey, go get me lunch, they go get me lunch. When I say, hey, sit or stand or whatever, these people do this because of what I represent. And when I watch you, Jesus, this is what the Roman centurion is saying, when I watch you, Jesus, it's the same way, that, that you seem to be uh, something bigger going on than just yourself. So he says, look, you don't have to come to my house. If you'll just say the word because of who you represent and because of what you know, I can see that's happening, if you'll just say the word based on your authority, I know my servant will be healed. And Jesus, <laughs> I love this. This is what it says. It's in the Gospel of Matthew. Look this up for yourself. This is why you should read your Bible, okay? When Jesus heard this, he was amazed, right? But, but like, why? Why was he amazed? Well, it says that in the text too. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, this is great. Truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. In other words, no son or daughter of Abraham, no one who knows all the things that God's up to, even has the kind of faith that this guy has. And it amazed Jesus. Now, I want to point something out before I tell you the other instance, okay? 
We have this temptation to think, and I don't know why this happened. It's, it's a 21st century thing, and I think if I'm being really honest, I'm not trying to pick on us, okay, because I am one of these two. We as Western Christians, we're like American Christians, we think that what we do to impress Jesus is to learn stuff, right? The more knowledge we have, the more, the, the more gifted we become, the more things we memorize, the more, you know, the more we learn, the more we can pick apart theology and doctrine and say this person's right and that person's wrong. We think that's what impresses God. But you need to remember, Jesus was never amazed at anyone's knowledge. <laughs> never once. You know why? <laughs> because he's Jesus. He already knows everything, right? I mean, he is all-powerful. He has all the knowledge. There was never a moment where he goes, wow, right? You are so knowledgeable about things. But he sure as heck was impressed with the guy's faith. Wow, I've not seen anyone in all of Israel who has this kind of faith. That's what Jesus said. I think that's really cool. Now, the, the second instance is a little different, okay? So there's another instance where Jesus was amazed, uh, amazed and this one's not as good, okay? Um, so Jesus uh, has gone back home. This is in Mark chapter six is where this is found. Jesus, you gotta remember, he, he spent his entire life all the way up to 30 years old living uh, with his family, living in, in Nazareth, living uh, just a normal life. And then all of a sudden he, he, his ministry begins. He gets baptized, he goes out, starts sharing things. So people start hearing about all these miracles. And I don't know what it's been like for you. I went home once after I kind of left, went to college, went to seminary, you know, ministered to three or four churches, then came back to visit. Um, I had a very similar experience. I'm not putting myself in Jesus' camp, but you know, going home is sometimes hard. And so Jesus goes home and you know, he does a few miracles and people are you know, starting to be really impressed. But then all of a sudden, the crowd gets a little jealous. So the crowd gets a little upset and they go, whoa, 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 whoa hold on, hold on, hold on. Isn't, isn't this the carpenter, right? Like, that's so real. They're like, who would write this if it wasn't true, right? No one, no one says this about Jesus, but it happened, right? Isn't this, isn't this the guy down the street that used to just hammer nails and stuff? Isn't this the guy that built me a chair that's in my, you know, that exists? He's the guy that put my table together and sanded off that bench that I really wanted. Isn't that the guy, right? Isn't this Mary's son? Mary, come here. Mary, is this yours, <laughs> right? Didn't we, when we watch you grow up, didn't we know all the things about you? We've seen you for 30 years, isn't this the brother of James, right? James, the brother of Jesus, who I love this about him, but James was not a believer in Jesus until his brother was resurrected. And then all of a sudden he goes, okay, not only is he my brother, he's my Lord. James, right? Isn't this your brother? And at this point, James would be fairly cynical, you know, like every brother would, you know, your brother gets really famous and you're like, isn't this your brother? Well, I don't know, maybe, right? Sort of. But then this, you know, isn't this the brother of Joseph and Judas and Simon? Maybe you didn't know that Jesus had a big family. Maybe you didn't know he had sisters. That's why you should read your Bible. Aren't his sisters standing here with us? They're like, come on. Isn't this that guy? This is just, this is just Jesus, right? He's just the guy. And Jesus' response to all this is, is um, shocking, right? But he says this. He was amazed at their lack of faith. He was amazed. Like, Wow. So the two things, okay, the two things that only, the only two things that ever impressed Jesus, that only left him amazed, had to do with faith. Great faith and a lack of faith. Or, you know, big faith and small faith. Big faith and small faith. Jesus was amazed at this distinction, okay? Now, all of this is kind of set up for what, what the point of the message is today, um, and, and it's that, you know, like, I want you to have big faith. And I believe that the first century church only accomplished what they were able to accomplish because they had big faith. Big faith that was active faith, right? Because big faith is active faith. Big faith causes you to do something. And the characteristic, the distinction of the first century church was something's different. The world is not the same. And they don't seem to be the same either. And they're, they're, they're loving their neighbors differently and they're, they're, they're treating each other with respect differently and they're looking at a bigger picture differently. They're not caught up in politics or they're not caught up in, in the, the mainstream or they're not caught up in, in these feuds or these disputes. They seem to settle their relational junk quicker. Why are they this way? What was this? Big faith, active faith. And so here's the setup, okay? The, the whole point of what I've been trying to say for the past few minutes, right, is that I want, right, the vision that I have um, that God has given me for what he called me to do, 
right, um, is, to, is to create a church full of people with big, active faith. In fact, if I could say, um, I don't know, the elders have never said this, so y'all are sitting in the room, you can tell me if you think I'm wrong. But I've always thought that one of the reasons that I ended up getting this job when I interviewed was because I came in and said, look, when I, when I come here, I want to help create and foster and shepherd a church, right, that has, has big, active faith. That, that, that we're living, breathing followers of Jesus, that we're disciples who are bought in and on fire and relationally connected in the greatest relationally connected church ever because our faith grows in relational connection. And what I found out later was that 25 years before when this church was founded, it was founded not because Tuscaloosa needed another church, but because Tuscaloosa needed a different kind of church, a church full of people with big, active faith. And I think what God's up to here at TCAT is creating a movement, right? Reclaiming the ecclesia, this assembly of people who called out to have big active faith. So what, what produces big active faith? Again, I've, I've showed this before. It's been three or four years since I talked about this, I guess now. I'm in my fourth year, and it was almost at the very beginning when I talked about this before. So bringing it back, but you may have heard it before. Uh, what grows your faith? Well, we've identified five things. And I've been talking about this for years using different words. This, this is much more flashy and catchy with the words that, that maybe I started with, but it's all the same. If you think about the things that made your faith grow, you'd probably tell a story that would fit into one of these five categories, and we call them the five faith catalysts. The five faith catalysts. The, in other words, the five things that are going to make your faith take off. And I'm letting you behind the veil a little bit here, but if you look at these things, you're going to realize that we've built our church and built our environments in order to try to do our best to give you these things, right? And the very first one is practical teaching. So the first faith catalyst is practical teaching. I know for me that the gospel really took off when somebody explained it to me in a way that made sense and gave me something I could do about it, all right? Uh, it's a joke, but I loved it. Like last week when Hope said in her baptism video that I don't lollygag and I just get to the point. I love that for two reasons. One, because she appreciates me and I love her so much. But number two, because she gets the point, right? That we want to be practical. That Look, I, I love theology and, and I have some, some groups of intellectuals that I can sit down with and we can study and talk about deep stuff for hours and hours and hours because I love it. But the truth is if what I'm saying up here doesn't cause you to want to do something differently with your life, I feel like I have failed. And so we're really intentional that in all of our environments, that we're really practical. Here's what Jesus would do, and here's how you can do it. And we end every message with here's two or three steps of things that you can put into practice right now. Practical teaching grows your faith. And as much as we can, we try to be really intentional to give you practical things to do next. Now, the second thing that grows your faith is personal ministry. My personal ministry. And I don't just mean like, oh, the cubic trip was incredible and having people say yes to that and this is why we send people overseas. But this is also why we put people to the front door. And this is why we, we, we you know, put people in, in kids to invest in the next generation. This is why we, we send people to work in students. Uh, when you find that thing that God built you to do, and you just say yes to it, right? And maybe that yes to you is, again, being a door greeter or working with middle schoolers or, 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 or helping out high school students to have difficult conversations about stuff that they're wrestling with or, 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 or that you collect the money or that you, you show up and clean or whatever, right? When you put your faith in action, your faith grows. Your faith is gonna grow. So like, look, it, I think it's really important to invest in the next generation. And I know we harp in here a lot about having more volunteers for kids and more volunteers for students. And part of that's very practical. I'm spoiling a message for later in the year, but did you know that so far since January, our elementary and preschool ministry has grown 47% in this church? You can clap for that, okay? 47%. Now, Okay, only people who love you say hard things. Ask me how much our volunteer base for elementary school has grown this year. Not 47%. <laughs> I sat in there a couple weeks ago when Andrew preached in here and I was a second grade small group leader. I was overwhelmed, right? How many kids? It's like 45 elementary school kids over there right now, right? I don't know if you were here three years ago when I got started, but I think I might have brought the two we had with me. Um, and so like, that's a lot. God's doing great things. But personal ministry is, it is very practical when we bring this up. Like, we need your help to continue what God's up to. But it's also very personal. God needs you to be moving and giving of yourself and putting yourself in a vulnerable spot where you can trust him so he can grow your faith. 
Number three, private disciplines. Uh, private spiritual disciplines is well, what I, you know, if you know what spiritual disciplines are, it just doesn't fit on the screen. So private disciplines, private spiritual disciplines. When you decide, you know what, I, I'm, I'm gonna read my Bible today. I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna, I'm gonna devote myself to fasting or I'm gonna, I'm gonna be really intentional to, to, to work on my, my own personal walk with God on my own. And you do this in private when nobody else is watching, your faith grows. I don't want to out somebody, but just this week I had a conversation with someone who, like, the reason they're, they're, they even know there is a God is because somebody handed them a Bible one day and they decided to just open it and start reading. Something really special happens. Private spiritual disciplines are your way of, like, this is why I say in my sermons about every couple of sermons I say, hey, you should read your Bible, right? This is why you should read your Bible. This is why you should pray. This is why you should, because these things make your faith grow. All right, number five, last one, or number four, sorry, providential relationships. Providential relationships. Um, if you talk to people who, who have big faith, right, and you ask them how they got there, eventually, sooner or later, most of them will come up and say, I met this guy, I met this woman, I met this person, I went to this Bible study, and this guy kind of took me under his wing, this woman really, like, invested in me, or this, this adult, right, had patience with me when I was in high school, this, this, this adult had, like, really patience with me when I was in elementary school, and it just made my faith, whatever, right? And these, res these relationships were something God used to make their faith get bigger, right? I, me personally, I, 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 I am the way I am for a couple of reasons. One, my mother, who never stopped investing in me even when I had kind of ran away from God. And then a guy named Jim Fant, who uh, I met accidentally at a meeting I didn't want to go to, who never gave up on me, even when I was wrestling and, and upset and frustrated with God and everybody else around me. And they spent the time that I needed in that relationship to help me grow my faith is providential. And the last one, number five, I said to spoil it a minute ago, pivotal circumstances. Right? Pivotal circumstances are those things that happen where um, you know, something happens and it's major, usually a negative thing, and it, it happens and it's hard, but it actually, like through it somehow, some way, God shows up and you find yourself deepening your relationship with God. Like you know, something happens that, you should, that should have wrecked you, but, but like for some reason you feel stronger in your faith. I'm gonna come back to this one in a minute, okay? But let's just, let's just look at our list for a second. Let's, let's just be honest. The, you, the, the local church can only do so much, right? We as TK can only do so much. You have a part to play in all five of these things. Now again, there's some things that we as a church can control. Like number one, practical teaching. I told you I'm really committed to that, um, that practical teaching is, is, is something I, I try my best to do. And it may leave us in a place where we're really like, you know, maybe there's a um, piece of this. You'd love for me to say something really hard and complicated and theological. There's an environment for that, I promise. But it's not necessarily here. Right? And then also personal ministry. We, we, can, we can do our best to, to set up places for you to be able to serve. Right? But you're still going to show up. At the end of the day, like I can give you all the volunteer opportunities in the world, you still have to say yes. So we, we can kind of sort of control these things. You still just have a personal investment you have to make. And then listen, the other three, these are all on you, right? Let's look at the rest of our list. These things are all on you. Like, um, you know, I can't make you go read your Bible. Like how weird would that be? I just show up at your house and say, where's your Bible, right? Uh, or, or providential relationships, as much as I'd love to, I can't force you to get into a relationship with anybody. And then look, pivotal circumstances, you don't, want, you don't want the church in this, right? Like you're here and I send a volunteer to go to your house and set it on fire. And then you, you end up like your house burns down and it makes you sad, but you pray and your faith grows. Like no, right? You got enough of these on your own. And in fact, here's the thing. If you didn't know this to be true, Jesus said in this life we will have trouble. And he didn't mean he was excluding his followers. He meant all of us. And so this is coming whether we want it to or not. But the thing that makes it different for people, when those pivotal circumstances come, when, when, there's, when there's moments where something should have wrecked them and it didn't, the thing that usually happens is they had a place, right? They had, they had, a, they had a circle of people. And, you know, I love Rose, which is what you're sitting in today. I love what I do. I love getting ready to, you know, getting able to unpack scripture and great stories and I love to speak uh, and be here as a part of this but but the truth is your real lasting life change is going to happen in a circle not a row and so that's why we as a church have invested like you don't know this but like corporately there's not a lot of benefit to us corporately necessarily for you to be in a row or in a circle right to be in a small group but we believe in it so much that we spend money and we buy we hire staff people and we throw parties to convince you to get in a circle with another group of people because we know you need it for your faith we know you need it 
You have to have a place where you can process out loud. Right? You need a place where you can process out loud. All of us go through stuff. Even me, okay? Then there are circles that I have that if I didn't have, and some of you sitting in this room, you know who you are, right? If I didn't have that circle, the group of people that I could sit down with and really share what was on my heart, what I'm struggling with, what I'm fearful of, where, where, where my growth edges are, right? Everybody needs that area to process out loud. Everybody needs a place where they can share their doubts. Maybe you've not been to a church that said this out loud before, but I will. I think doubt is a part of faith. We believe that doubt is a part of faith. Not that, not that you don't you know, have things that reassure you, but the truth is if you were just completely convinced it's not faith anymore, it's just an acceptance, right? Faith is believing something you haven't seen. And so day, doubt becomes a natural part of that. And when you run into those places, right, when you run into those places where you have doubts or fears, you need a circle to share those in. You need a circle to share your questions, to ask your questions. You need a place where you can go and say, I don't understand this. I don't know what this means. I read this scripture and I, I'm confused. You need that spot. You need a spot to tell your story. You know, some of you um, have never been in a circle before where you can really, truly tell your story. And I don't just mean like how you came to TCAT, right? Maybe even not just, you know, what's going on in your life today, but your story, why you are the way you are. You've never been able to sit down in a circle and share that, and that we, we want those spaces. You need a place where you can be prayed with and prayed for, where you can pray with someone and pray over someone. Some of you have never been in a place where someone has prayed for you out loud, where they've prayed your name, right? And, and this room's too big for us to be able to do that for everybody. And look, the truth is, all of us are in different walks of life and different circles and different seasons of life. And, and no pastor, no Sunday morning environment, no matter where you go, can get it all right for everybody all the time. It's just too complex. And that's okay. That's why you need a circle. You need a group of people who know you, who love you anyway, and want to see what God will do next in your life. And most of all, most of all, circles are the place where you become accountable, right? It's the, mo it's the most important place for you to feel accountability in your walk with God. And here's why this matters, because some of you are like Michael Scott from The Office, and you think you work best in an environment with zero accountability, right? Um, if you're not an Office fan, I feel bad for you. Anyway, um, you work at best in an environment with zero accountability, but that's because then you can do whatever you want. <laughs> and some of you, I love you, and I'm telling you a truth you don't want to hear, but some of you don't need to be in charge of your own life right now because you can't make the wise choice because of your emotions or because of your situation or because of your season or whatever. And you need a group of people who love you through that and will walk with you to help you get where you want to go. You need a group of people. And I know this to be true because of my own life, and, and if you're in a group, I hope you're nodding to what I'm going to say next. You'll be more likely to follow through. You'll be more likely to follow through on what you say you want to do with people of faith surrounding you. Yeah, you know, it's like when you go to the gym. If you say you're going to go to the gym alone, you're more than likely, you know, going to hit the snooze button on Sunday morning. But if there's somebody waiting there for you, right, there's somebody waiting there at the gym for you, you're going to go because you feel accountable to them getting up and showing up too, right? Same thing in your walk with God. Same thing in your faith. And all of this, like why do this, right? Well, because here's the thing, this is what we've learned. And I've said this a couple different ways before, but like when your faith, your active faith, right, intersects with God's faithfulness, in other words, your, your obedience, when you say yes to following something God wants you to do and it intersects with God's faithfulness, that's where change happens, right? Th this is where your faith grows. This is where your life changes, Active decision making. This is why James, the brother of Jesus, when he wrote, he wrote um, a letter later in life, and, and um, we actually have it recorded. It's the book of James, it's one of the last books in our New Testament. This is why James, the brother of Jesus, says this do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, right? I know like, some of you, uh, and I'm, again, I'm not picking or being critical because I used to do this too. Uh, you show up at church so that you can go, hey, God, you see me here? <laughs> this is me. I, got, I showed up and I did it, right? You, me, we're good. We're good for the week, right? And I listened to the preacher and I didn't fall asleep that much. So I'm here and I'm good, right? We, you and I, we're good. And James is like, don't deceive yourself. Just hearing is not enough, right? Do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. Put it into practice. Like, oh gosh, I know that that would, you know, I had such a great religious experience, but now I'm going to go home and do nothing about it. That's a common behavior. 
Because, look, the truth is, I can't hold you accountable. As much, I mean, if, unless you're in my small group. If you're in my small group, we're holding each other accountable, okay? But if I'm not in your small group, then, then I, I can't hold you accountable. And God says, listen, you've got to get in that relationship. You've got you to reinvest in that relationship. Or God says, hey, you've got to get out of that relationship. Or God says, hey, you've got to move. Or God says, hey, you've got to go apologize. Or God says, hey, you've got to be stronger in your will. Or God says, hey, you've got to lay this down or pick this up. Or you've got uh, you to do these things. And God says that. Don't just listen to the word, do what it says. Don't just listen and say, God, you know what? You're right, I probably should do that. And then live another five years in misery or anguish or destruction because you didn't want to do what it says. So let's go back to our list for a second, okay? Right. These are the three things that I can't control, right? These are the things that I can't force you to do. And these are the things that are best provided for, held accountable for, checked in on, in a circle. And this is why we talk about small groups. And once a year, at least, I stand on this stage and I tell you how important it is and I beg and plead with you to jump in a circle, to jump in a small group, to find a group of people and say yes to meeting with them weekly, to work through your faith and find out a better way to do life than what you're doing right now because life is complicated and you wanna get it right. Then a circle is where you can start. But if that's not motive, enough motivation, I told you I wanted to come back to pivotal circumstances for just a second and I'm done, okay? This is the last thing. Pivotal circumstances are coming whether you want them to or not. And me, you do this long enough, and I've been, I guess I was trying to add this up. This is my 19th year of ministry. Uh, I started when I was, I was really young. It's, it's complicated. I'll tell you the story some other time, okay? But I've been doing this long enough to know that, that trouble's coming. And there's only, honestly, um, like four or five stories out there and, and you're unique, and you're, you know, you, but, but your story may not be, right? There's just things that happen, and they happen over and over and over again. When these pivotal circumstances come, what I've learned is I watch, and there's some people that like this thing that, that, that I thought would destroy them actually makes them stronger in their relation with God. And then someone else who experiences the same thing, it actually destroyed them. Like it just wrecked them. It just like upended their life. It just changed everything for them. Do you know what the common denominator between the difference of the two is? The people who didn't get wrecked by it had a circle. And the people that did, that didn't, well, they didn't. And the, the moment may come for you. I hope it doesn't, but those moments of pivotal circumstance where something just blows up your life, you're going to want a group of people who know you. And you've got to start right now investing in that. Because it's not something that's, you know, that just happens. It's not something you just instantly get. You find a group of people that you can invest in relationship with and you grow your faith. And then when your life, when life happens to you, they're there for you. Because the pivotal circumstances will either to strengthen or destroy you. And this, this choice, again, is really like the difference between this is, is what happens to the people who didn't. It's, it's what we believe, who we listen to, and how we frame it. And all of that stuff is shaped by a circle. What do I want for you? What do I want for you? And if you haven't been paying attention to me, come back, okay? <laughs> I know it's hard. You sit in this room and you stare at the ceiling sooner or later, but like come back for just a second, okay? You ready? The thing I want for you is someone who cares about you, is someone who, who feels like I, I've been trying to figure out what God would have me do and also what I think he would have all of us do. The thing that I want for you is big, active faith. And you're gonna have to have a circle to get there. The, the first century church knew that. Right, the apostles knew that. And for generations, for generations, Christians have been gathering on Sunday mornings and then gathering in homes or gathering in small groups and circles at a church or in a, small, in a classroom or someplace, in a coffee shop, over lunch. And they've been doing life together. Now, I told you we're heavily invested in this. Let me tell you how and then I'm gonna let you go, okay? Um, every year we throw a massive party. We actually do this twice a year, but the fall is the biggest one. So if you're new, you came at a perfect time. We call this party group lunch. And this party is happening next Sunday from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. We know how hard it is, like, because you're gonna feel like these relationships are engineered, but the truth is, listen, most of our, our relationships are engineered. I love my neighbors. You don't love my neighbors because you don't know who they are, right? But I only know my neighbors and love my neighbors because I moved there right? Small group's kind of the same thing. You don't know what you don't know until you meet them, but we want to make it as safe and easy for you as possible. So we hold the first group meeting here, and we do all the teaching, and we tell you all the fun, and you can get to know them, and if you're like, I need an off-ramp, we give it to you. But if you're like, these are my people, then we give you the space to invest and give it a shot. And that all starts next Sunday, August 25th from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. right here in this room. 
All you have to do, all you have to do, this is, we make it as easy as humanly possible. We already hired a staff person who would love more than anything to help you find a group. You just have to say, I want a group. Go to tk.church slash groups, fill out the little form, say, I want a group, and we will help you find one between now and then, and you can meet your people in this room next Sunday. I cannot wait to see what God does through the circles in our church this year because you're gonna be a part of it, and it's going to be awesome. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for these people gathered here. Lord Jesus, ask, ask as we leave this place today that, that you would give us guidance and wisdom and discernment and courage to step out and have active, living, moving, changing faith. Faith that makes us do things differently. Faith that's not just a religious experience, but a way of life. And God bless our small groups and our circles this year to bring about life change. We love you and we trust you. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you for coming to TCAT today. If you're a college student, meet our directors in the hallway after. God bless. I'll see you next.